Hi everyone, welcome to the EdTech podcast where our mission is to improve the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation and impact. This week I'm recording the intro from London as I'm here for the Economist Innovation at Work event. I'm really looking forward to attending and participating tomorrow. That's a nice fit with this week's episode, the second episode in our series with the Female EdTech Fellowship, which is a collaboration between the European EdTech Alliance and Supercharger Ventures to support the growth of the most promising female founders in Europe. In this second episode of the series, I'm in conversation with the amazing Nila Michalski, co-founder and now CEO of QFox, and Riccardo Zezza, the Italian founder and CEO of LifeEed. We're talking about lifelong learning, the demands in reskilling and upskilling, applying life skills into the workplace and securing investment for fast growth businesses. Before the episode, a big shout out to anyone I had the chance to connect with at BET. And coming up on the podcast, more episodes from the Female Fellowship, a chat about virtual humans and why they're different to chatbots and a live recording on skills, schools and employability from BET. Okay, let's get into this week's episode with Neela and Ricarda. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye. So, um, really excited. We're on to episode two of our European Female EdTech Fellowship Series. Um, I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, Nila Lechowski and Ricarda Zezza. Uh, Nila is co-founder and now CEO of QFox. Um, and QFox are based in Berlin and have been noted by Education Technology Insights as Germany's fastest growing tech startup and Europe's EdTech Startup of the Year, which is some uh, pretty amazing accolades. And Ricarda Zezza is the Italian founder and CEO of LifeFeed. And LifeFeed is a learning platform that transforms life transitions and caregiving activities such as parenthood, caring for elderly relatives and going through a crisis. So all the things that make us human and that we all go through into opportunities to develop soft skills. And Ricardo's vision is to work for a world where everyone can express their whole inner wonder and her inspiration is fueled every day by her children, Marta and Luca. And today we're going to be talking about the lifelong learning revolution. And uh, this is something I'm very excited about because I think during the six years that I've been doing the podcast, um, lifelong learning has sort of slowly uh, snowballed and now is, you know, whether you call it lifelong learning or uh, future of work, HR tech is a really, really interesting sector and one that I think most people now intuitively know that, uh, you know, we, we have to keep learning throughout our lifetime. And any way to make that more accessible is a very, very good thing. So let's kick off. Um, Nina and Ricarda, um, can you tell us a little bit about what your big ideas are in, in education and lifelong learning? So who'd like to jump in first? I can do it if you want. So um, very, very briefly, I think that it's not sustainable in such a speed, uh, such a fast changing world to keep on thinking that you can fill people with new skills every time they need to learn new things. So I think that this is a quite old way of looking at education, the idea that people are empty containers that must be filled, while there is so much we already have. So I think that we can have a better, let's say we can, in a way, be inspired by environmental activities and recycle better what we already have, uh, recycle better the skills we already develop in all our com- complex lives to use them in different roles. So I think that the education, what's interesting nowadays is that education is trying to, um, to progress by applying technology to old ways of educating, while there is a huge opportunity for transforming the way we look at education and really rethinking the way we think what education means. And by the way, just because education is from Latin and I'm Italian, it mm-hmm. means Education means you you pull something out up of someone. You don't add something to someone. So I love that because uh, yeah, it assumes that we've got a deficiency. Whereas you know, you, um, I, I love your whole take on things because I mean, um, the two times I've had kind of maternity leave of some kind has it, been the two times when I've set up businesses. 
and it's been this kind of really fertile um point in my life where you where you just kind of take time to look at problems think about new avenues to explore and i i think i so i completely get where you're coming from in terms of what you're doing with life feed and then uh, neela can you tell us a little bit more about qfox as well yeah absolutely yeah so our vision is to you know make learning more individual because um, what we see is that in the education sector, it's like the one size fits all approach, right? And um, we, our, our approach is to make it more um, individual to the learners. Um, and um, I think that's very important because um, the way how we learn, the way how we teach is totally different to the employees and also to the people out there. And we try to make that more adaptable to the individual needs and also to the experiences and the skill levels. And that's what we are looking for, right? Or we, what we are trying to do to make learning more individual, more lifelong and also um, personal. Okay, brilliant. And and so in terms of the individual uh, needs of different people, is that sort of could that come down to things like neurodiversity or you know where they're working what kind of lens do you put on that yeah diversity but also from the personal side because you know everyone have different skills levels right and the reality is that for example they join a course and um, there are let's say 10 people and everyone have different skills level but it's the same for everyone so the same knowledge the same topics um, the same way how we teach them and for us it's important to understand first of all the experiences um, the skill levels and also the individual needs uh, of the learners and that's what we are working on and what are both of your kind of founder stories how did you you know take that step from idea to you know incorporating a business finding a team raising investment how did that all work out for both of you yeah a long way to go ups and downs and uh, we started 2015 uh, together with my co-founders um, before we started with Crowfox, we already had an education company. It was the largest um, provider here in Germany when it comes to IT trainings. And um, we already served different clients and we um, got the understanding that um, our different clients have different training needs. And that's why we started to, you know, set up a marketplace, especially for B2B education. And later we developed a um, learning platform. So that's our offering right now, um, providing a marketplace and also a learning platform for the B2B um, sector and to train our people. And our founding story is... Uh, easy. So we sit down and said, okay, there's a real gap, right? Um, so we have a problem in the market because w the companies have different um, education needs, but there's no single provider who can, you know, prepare them for different kind of topics, language, IT training, soft skills, and so on. And that's why we said, okay, the the employees and the people they go to let's say booking.com or amazon to to find in one stop shop everything they need and mm -hmm. that's why we started that story and um since that um you said that we are growing very fast especially in the b2b sector and right now we have up to 30 people working here and try to you know um bring new learning to the people and also bring new learning to um, the companies and Corona situation, it's um, a booster for the digital education and also a booster for the education and the companies, but it's still a long way to go for us. So even if we have birthday today and we are seven years old, we have still a, a long way to go to, you know, transform the way how people learn. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and Ricardo, how about you? How did uh, Life Feed begin? Yeah, I, I, am, I used to be a manager in big companies for 15 years. So I had my career as a manager in Italy and international. And then I realized that every time there's something happening in my life, such as becoming a mother, as a good example, it was, was perceived as a problem. And it was a paradox because I had been through so much soft skill training where the challenge was to have the practice of the soft skills. While I could see that in my personal life, there was so much practice of soft skills. So when it happened the second time with my second child, uh, this conflict, uh, I realized there was a blue ocean there. 
because there was so much need for soft skills, but companies were not seeing that those soft skills were actually trained by life. And so I started studying, as often women do. So my first step was to study, to research if it was real. I started with the idea of motherhood. Was it real that motherhood developed skills? And I found a lot of scientific evidence of this. Not only motherhood, but every life transition develops skills, develops soft skills. So it's a, it's a training round for soft skills. So I started making workshops. This is about 10 years ago. Eight years ago, I wrote a book with a co-author and it's an executive coach. And, uh, and then it worked so well uh, with the workshops. It, they had such a big impact that we wanted to scale it. We wanted to reach more people. And that's where technology came in. So my company is six years old and I'm about to be 50. That's also, I think, very interesting because I think quite often we can start new companies in the second adulthood of our life when we want to really create something, when we feel like we want to generate something, we want to yeah. get something. And so with the, the platform changed everything because, first of all, you can reach so many people. You can reach new mothers, new fathers, caregivers. You can reach as many as you want. You can be adaptive. So the content that people receive adapts to their life transition. So you can receive training content which adapts the learning experience to what's happening in your life right now, making it very relevant. And the methodology is reflective. So people tend to write about their experiences and the skills they're using. So we use AI to analyze those content. So fast forward six years later, the start of the company, we, yeah, we also quite big in Italy. We have 80 uh, companies as customers. We have around 30,000 users. Only less than percent of our income is international, but the international uh, opportunity is huge at the moment. I would say we have a bit of challenge because we are very innovative. So we're not clearly a, a learning management system. We are not because you won't find the typical modules about skills in our platform. We are at the crossroad between well-being and development. So people feel better and therefore have more talents. So sometimes, especially in these times of uncertainty, it can be challenging for companies to understand what budget we are about. So sometimes it's welfare and sometimes it's development. But the potential, I mean, the opportunity is huge because well-being is, is on the map and continuous reskilling is on the map. And what better than life with this? Yeah, there's so many good points there. Like um, I'm turning 40 next year and the same thing. I think you, 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 the, the, the legacy thing starts kicking in and you're like, OK, this is it. You know, I need to create something that's going to impact and, and uh, you know, hopefully make the world a better place. And then, and then the other thing was you both mentioned the effect of the pandemic. And um, Ricardo, I can totally see with your uh, business, uh, you know, perhaps the effect of the great resignation on you know, needing to look at, uh, you know, these transition points in our life and make sense of them and apply them to perhaps new contexts that, you know, perhaps tap into sort of more purposeful work. And so both of you, I think, you know, it'd be great to hear what the effect of the pandemic was and whether you had to pivot in any way or, you know, how, how that's played out as well. When the pandemic hit, we had just launched our third um, programme for caregivers. So we were out with fathers, mothers and caregivers as transitions. And we realised that the, the COVID has been like the first real shared global experience of leave because everybody was sent home, everybody was going through a life transition at the same time, mm. because COVID is a life transition. So we realized we could apply what we knew about transitions and skills to the COVID. So we were very fast, thanks to a seeding we had done the year before and the improvement in technology to create a new program for COVID. And we started also selling to companies this opportunity for people to learn the kind of skills they were they were improving thanks to COVID. That was the first immediate action we, we had. And then from that, we could really open the platform to every life transition. So COVID taught us to apply our methodology to every possible life transition because it gave us the opportunity to involve everybody uh, in, uh, in our program. And now it's a matter of really going global because this kind of we, we could deploy a lot of data. We have a lot of data in our in our platform. We use them a lot to change the culture because we can see what happens at an individual level, but it's also as important to show at the company level what is happening when people open these doors. So also the data part has been growing a lot with the pandemic we, because we had many more users and we can tell a better story to, to companies. Fantastic. Thank you. Neela. Yeah, let me add here. Um 
Absolutely the same on our side. Um, on the B2B sector, you know, COVID had a large impact and still still have a large impact. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, COVID will change everything. The business models, the way how people learn, the way how people work, and also um, the, the way how we teach people. And um, from our perspective, um, when it started 2020, right, it was like, oh, my goodness, everything is down. We had the first lockdown. Our companies um, were totally closed. So we are, for example, in the automotive sector, but also in the IT sector. So they, they just shut down um, uh, their, you know, companies. Companies, uh, their locations and um, all employees sit down uh, at home uh, waiting for some work. So, and in, in this crisis situation, education is always the first thing um, companies, you know, cut. They cut the budget for consulting, for education, and also for, you know, travel costs. So it was the same on our side. But then from my perspective, the companies realized, okay, we still have a really talent fight. We have to, you know, change our business models. There's a new work approach. So we have to think how we can train our people um, and how we can move forward with our company. And the reality is here in Germany, but it's also on the European side, um, especially in Germany, let's say 60% of all SMBs do not have any tool to develop their people on a digital level. And um, that's what we see right now, that um, the companies start to invest more in tools and also in learning platforms and in digital learning opportunities for their for their employees because they have to they have to train them to new job roles to new business models um, for the future and um, I think education becomes more important than ever and I'm absolutely happy that a small virus changed the way right um, how uh, how companies think about them how they train their people and so we we are focusing on a software on our our software because it's like a marriage, right? If you um, have a software in a company, then it's not easy to let it out. Um, they have to move forward. So that's what we did in, in, in this uh, time. We focus on our learning platform, try to, you know, assist our companies, our customers in this struggling time and bring good education to, to their employees. And um, that's what we are doing right now. And we will do that in the future too, um, focusing on our learning platform and bring that to different kinds of companies and also help the small um, and uh, medium-sized enterprises to, you know, integrate tools to develop the people and help them to, to reach the future. And Sophie, there is one more thing that uh, really changed with, uh, with COVID is that the fact that everybody has have more roles, have a complex life, suddenly became visible to the world. I mean, we knew it. I think uh, it, it's not just about mothers, but let's take mothers. Mothers knew that there is much more than work and a, a lot of complexity and things happening going on. But somehow, until before COVID, we thought we could keep the things separate and the things that were not seen and were invisible doesn't, didn't seem to exist. While by looking at in everybody's screen and seeing their houses and realizing they had lives and complexity, this suddenly became visible. And together with the Generation Z coming to the market and new values, I think now we cannot go back to the old way of working. Now it's, we cannot stop seeing that how complex everybody's life is. And, and um, the interesting thing that we see with LifeEed is that basically companies are using only less than 25% of the available talents they have because people express 75% of their talents in personal roles, in non-work-related roles. And those are all wasted resources that could be brought to the workplace and the other way around. And if you start circulating those talents, the, what happens is that you have more skills, but you also have more care in the workplace. And that's another very important thing that I think we realize with COVID is that we do need more care also in the workplace. And we mm -hmm. can take it from, from our families, from our capacity to love. There's a couple of things there. So um, I think in terms of in the school setting, we've seen a shift towards greater understanding of social emotional learning of, of students and getting that right in order for them to take on learning and you mentioned about well-being and 
Um, Nilo, you mentioned about sort of every company now needing and SMEs, not just large companies, needing to focus on the learning um, culture within an organization. And I saw an article circulating this week, and it was about how every every company will be an ed tech company in the sense that every company will need to be imbued with this sense of learning and development. And I completely subscribe to that idea. Um, and one thing that's quite interesting from where we're coming from, like, you know, there's quite defined, we like to define our sectors. So we have ed tech, we have well-being, HR tech, learning and development. But it seems like there's really a blurring now of all of these different areas. And so, for example, the well-being of employees relates to, you know, um, whether they will stay within a company, which relates to HR tech, which relates to, you know, also this um, appetite from Gen Zs around self-development, which also, again, relates to retaining and recruiting top talent. So is that something that you're seeing as well? And how do you think, you know, that will play out? Will we have a more continuous thread between all of these different um, sort of sector perspectives, I suppose? Yeah, absolutely. And um, from my perspective, it's all about, you know, creating and providing an ecosystem, right? And um, you have to bring education, recruiting, and also HR tech um, on one table. Yeah. And um, from my perspective, the most important task for the future for L&D departments, but also for HR managers and so on, is creating that ecosystem. Right. And um, using the power from the different sides to, you know, bring the best experiences to the employees or to the students um, and to help them. Yeah. And um, what I see is that, you know, recruiting is one department. L&D is one department. Tech is one department and the other thing is HR and so on but from my perspective what I said is it's, it's all about creating an ecosystem and um, using the power of the different departments and bring them to one table for the best experiences for the employees and for the people out there. Um, it also yeah it also made, made, made me laugh when I see that we, we can still differentiate between education and education technology for example which I mean there, there won't be any education without technology and there won't be any other activity without education, as you said, Sophie. So it's really blurring. And it's, the, the blurring is a problem. I mean, the, the still categorizing is a problem. So this categorization for companies like ours, which are innovating by blurring, by basically by reframing reality as it is. The point is that reality has already changed, but all the frames are, are, are refraining, so they say refraining, um, progress. Because yeah. all the frames show us pictures that are not uh, actual. And what we do by innovating is we create new frameworks that basically show the reality in a more proper way. Uh, so really, sorry, there is a machine, coffee machine. Uh, That's so there. Italian. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think that what, what you call blurring is basically new frames and innovation is creating new, new frameworks around reality and well-being and learning and progressing and, 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 and change making. They're all part of the same bucket of human potential. Mm -hmm. And the more we differentiate, the more we try to categorize, the more we are losing stuff. Because from those frames, they fall out, you know, the, the, the extra things that are real progress fall out of the frames. Yeah, no, I completely get it because it's kind of a bit like um, I listened to an amazing podcast about three years ago and it was looking at how people are moving to self-employment and working with lots of different companies. But like the, the, the eco system around mortgages around health insurance is still kind of like you will be employed for your whole life with this company and they will provide all of that so like you can see how quite often the systems take longer to kind of catch up with where we are in in terms of our working environments but that's also a problem because we are having conversation with investors for example and investors when they they want to apply innovation uh, ratings to what we do so they learn from fintech so they are looking for ed tech innovation by using fintech uh, frameworks. And that's crazy. I mean, we are talking about completely different. We're not talking about accelerating stuff. We're talking about learning. We're talking about human development. 
So it really is a problem, especially for innovation, because innovation needs to break boundaries. And so there must be much more a bigger vision, a bigger capacity of envisioning new new ways of con- connecting things. Yeah, I've, I've long had an issue with that um, comparison. So, for example, you know, quite often there's this shift towards optimization in, in the tech sector. And actually, in terms of long term understanding of concepts and learning, that's to do with spacing and things like that. So, like, it just doesn't kind of marry up sometimes. So, um, yeah, I completely see that. Um, what would be amazing for our listeners is if you could both share a couple of examples of your customers. So how they're coming to you, like what what it is that they are seeking in their particular example and um, yeah, how you're working together, because that will really bring to life what you do as well. So our customers are um, um, large enterprises, but right now we are focusing on the SMB sector because um, from our perspective, um, there's a lot of work to do, right? They don't have any tool to develop their people. They still have the problems finding new talents and uh, they have to change their business model models too. And when we talk to customers, they're always searching for, you know, um, two kinds of solutions. So the first thing is, of course, saving costs, right? That's always very important. And if you compare, let's say, digital learning to -to face-to-face learning, it's much more cost-effective because you don't have to travel. The employee can stay at home. Uh, The pricing is totally different. And let's say you are paying for a video, um, 10 or 20 euros compared to -to face-to-face training up to 2,500 euros, right? So it's a cost thing at one side. But the other thing is also the learning experience. And um, uh, Ricardo, you said that, and I'm very happy that you said that, that you're not providing a learning management system. Because the reality is that um, the the customers or also the companies, you know, they are they are buying a learning management system. But from my perspective, education, it's not about managing anymore. It's about providing a good learning experience. It's all about providing and self-service approach right and um, so that are the most important thing from my perspective when 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 customers come to our table and ask us to you know uh, provide a solution it's all about cost saving learning experiences and also you know um, help the employees to reach a new level because um, that's one of the most largest issues in the companies it's reskilling and upskilling and uh, sometimes they don't know the skill level. They don't know how to train the people into new job roles and so on. So that's something they are really looking for. And um, I think that's from our B2B um, uh, sector, the most important um, uh, task when it comes to, you know, how to, de- how to decide to a new system to train their employees. So um, two, two different examples on my side. One is um, a company that started a banking in the banking industry, started by, uh, was one of the first customers we had. And we're very proud because normally companies tend to stay with us for five, six years, 85% uh, renewal rate, which probably is the most important uh, indicator we can have as a tech platform. Um, they started with mothers. So they started with the mothers program. They, they, they bought the platform to really empower mothers, empower women when back from maternity leave, make them feel like they are stronger, apply for managerial roles, make them grow. Then they started involving fathers. We also push for that. That doesn't make any sense to give the opportunity to mothers and not to fathers. Fathers improve a lot their relational skills when they have this perspective on how fatherhood can uh, empower their managerial capacity and their professional skills. Then they also, this same bank also adopted this caregiver uh, uh, program when it started so they could involve older people because that's another point. Uh, there is this ageism uh, problem in a way. And I mean, uh, I'm, I'm 50 myself. I don't feel old at all. I feel I have a lot to, to give. And the caregivers, they have such an intense experience. People who take care of their own parents. Not everybody are parents, but everybody, almost everybody are children. So, uh, so there is a lot to learn in that, in that phase. And so this company has been buying every new program we, we created because they could see how it really engaged the people and really make those invisible skills become visible. 
And that's a typical case of company with whom we are working as a caring company. We call caring companies the companies that use the platform for all the caregiving. While another interesting case is a fashion company and a big fashion company that is using us in Europe. And they started with parents because they wanted the safe, let's say, the safe experience. But then they realized there was much more than that. And now they're using our uh, diverse talent index, which is a tool with which we can really give a, the company a number uh, of how much talent they're currently using and then measure again at the end of the year and see if this percentage has grown by really letting people bring to work their personal skills. And I think that having indexes is also very good. Nila said they're measuring a lot. Of that's very important because otherwise it's going to be always invisible, always very theoretical what to do. So we are very excited that we can provide numbers now at the end of the day. Here's an interesting question. How do you encourage the visibility of someone's whole skill set and whole self when we're working remotely? So, for example, I think before in an office capacity, you know, you could have events where you call out, oh, this person is amazing at music or da, da, da. And then when people are at home, sometimes work becomes quite task driven. And, you know, the tendency is to do your tasks, then switch off the laptop, then go and do all your, you know, own stuff like practicing the drums or painting or running or whatever it is so how do you encourage and support businesses to 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 bring that whole self in a virtual world as well and that's a huge problem that's and it's still quite invisible what you said Sophie the fact that by not meeting in person we we lose all that information about people all that small talk that we have before and after the meetings where real things are said the real relationship then start because I get to know you as a person. And that's why we are proposing also this kind of tool, such as showing who you are by even by putting a picture on the background of your Zoom uh, uh, video. And uh, for example, we are proposing a DNI week to companies where for one week everybody can display their multiple selves with an image. So display on the back the fact that they have different roles in life and start every meeting with conversations about each other's multiple selves. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that people find common common, uh, paths, even if, you know, you realize, oh, you also play volleyball or you also are a sister, you have a sister, you are a caregiver. And, but you need, at the moment, you need to create processes for this. It's not going to happen spontaneously. It needs to be pushed culturally by the companies. Otherwise, we will end up having, as we are having now, back-to-back meetings just on the target, just, sorry, I have to leave now, I have another one. And then you lose all the possibility of being creative, innovative, and really merging ideas as we do as humans when we are together. Absolutely. So a couple more questions, and then I'll let you uh, get back into your into your business days. So goals for t- the next couple of years, and then books, projects, or people that sort of inspire your work. Yeah, so our goal, um, we have a lot of goals. Yeah, of course, uh, that's uh, the life of a founder. But no, the most important thing from our side is, of course, um, um, closing our financial round because you need the money also to scale and also, you know, to innovate and bring new people into your um, office and working on a good projects. So a founding round is very important. But um, more important is then to find the right talent and to find the right team, right? And um, from my perspective, this is much more harder much more harder finding the right team uh, instead of uh, closing a founding round. So that's my perspective. So two uh, very important tasks. And um, the third one is um, the internationalization from our side because we have uh, global clients, right? And, and they want to provide the same skill levels, the same level of knowledge to their employee all over the world. So one of our large clients, it's an automotive um, company, right? They said to me, Nila, listen, in five years, we are not an automotive company anymore. We are a software provider. So yeah. it's a large yeah. reskilling um, and upskilling uh, need in our organization and it's for all of our employees all over the world right so for us it's very important to you know bring our offering into other countries in europe and uh, being a good provider um, to our clients and help them reach the full potential everywhere in the world 
And uh, when it comes to inspiring, I have a lot of um, people I'm looking at. But for me, the most important thing is to finding uh, women founders. Because on your way to scale up a company, you need role models, right? And um, what I'm always looking at is um, good founders like Ricarda, for example, and she's doing a great job, but also the other female founders here in our club, right? And um, for me, as a female founder, that's um, the most important thing to, you know, look at the uh, look at the girls, um, see what they are doing, uh, share the ideas, um, um, uh, innovate together and so on. And um, so, uh, yeah, my suggestion is to to find a role model. It, it, it's not maybe a very well-known person, but it could be someone else next to your office or a female founder and talk to them, uh, share your ideas and also, you know, share some issues uh, you have. And, um, and that's uh, for me, the most important thing. And um, the last thing I want to add um, this year, we closed a small round, right. And um, we won our first female investor. And that was Fantastic. a large milestone. And it's totally different, right? When she's on our investment board and we have our, you know, investors uh, meetings and so on, since she's there, it's an absolutely other culture for us. And it's um, absolutely different compared to our male uh, investors. And um, yeah, from for us, it was a great milestone to find a female investor, because it's uh, totally another way how we work together, how we share the ideas. And um, yeah, that's from my perspective, um, it was a good move. And um, I tried to, you know, raise more money with a lot of more female investors. Fantastic. No, I can totally see that and appreciate that. And uh uh, well, you are both my role models as well. So uh, thank you for being out there and doing it. And um, Ricardo, how about yourself? So next couple of years, yes. Um, <laughs> interesting time. <laughs> um, absolutely, we have to go international. We have such a high demand. So it's really, we need this money to, to, to increase our impact. I really believe that we can empower people to, to be their own change. I know I'm not saying anything new, but I really believe that people have most of what is needed. It's just about seeing it and, and unlocking it. So I think Italy has been a very good market as a starting point, but the world is much bigger and uh, we have to go for it. So invest in technology, invest in data to change the culture, invest in people. As Nila said, that's, they are the most important asset, the most challenging all the time. So now I have some good people in the team, so I feel much more energized. You also need money to pay the people. <laughs> so that's also very important. <laughs> and uh, for the, um, the suggestions, I have three. Um, one is... Um, um, I received many newsletters about HR. I think the most interesting one, the most advanced one I received is the one by John Bersin. I don't know okay, if you yeah. know him, but I think he's really, he has a good, he has a strong vision. And uh, I'm always, uh, see, I always see him pushing, pushing the progress of, of uh, HR and HR development. Uh, so very interesting. Um, I am a fan of knowledge. I'm constantly studying. I always have a research or a paper with me for the, for the moments in which I have to wait for someone, <laughs> so for the gaps, because it's not in the agenda to study. And in this sense, I really suggest this website, which is called Academia, we just want to see. They are incredibly good. They, they, they send you papers, scientific papers, and they learn by what you download to send you more in that range. They're all free papers, scientific papers. So it's really interesting to, to get to know, to have more knowledge about the topic. And then finally, I have on my desk this book, which uh, um, is called Composing a Life. And it's by Mary Catherine Bateson. Um, I think that women have been underlooked a lot. The knowledge that women have been generating across centuries has been hidden to most eyes. And it's impressive. Like this book is not even printed anymore. And this, I think it's an amazing book. And Composing a Life is really about how women's perspective is about not ranking things, but composing things and finding connection between things. <laughs> so I'm not the first one to say it. We are not the first ones to say it. It's been said by many women in the history. It just wasn't heard or published. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm laughing because I totally agree with that idea of like 
not ranking things in that way like it's far more complex so oh that's fantastic well i i uh wish you both well with your funding round hopefully we've got some uh, lovely um values aligned uh vcs listening in that will be straight on the phone and uh yeah thank you both for your time and for sharing what you're up to and uh wish you all the best for the rest of the year as well thank you sophia thank you Nila. it was really great yeah it was a great talk That's all for this week's episode. Thanks so much to Neela and Ricarda and do go and check out QFox and LifeFeed, which are both doing great things. A big shout out to any new listeners, old faithful listeners and anyone in between. And as always, if you fancy going to give a rate and review wherever you listen to your podcasts, that always goes down well. Have a great week, everyone. Bye bye.